James Ham with us. We will, uh, I don't know, I guess, keep you updated on whatever is going on with Shohei Atani. Yeah, so Shohei said that he's never bet on sports or baseball before. Well, all right. Okay. Okay. Wow. I've never bet on, I've never bet baseball or any other sports. I've never gone through a bookmaker to bet on sports. Hmm. Okay. So I guess I just, so he's not answering questions. W what I'd like to know is did his interpreter steal $4 million from him? Right. That's what I need to know. And if we get that address and he says, yes, he stole $4 million from me. Well, we okay. Got, we got another quote. I don't know how you pronounce his name, but uh, my pay to his interpreter has been stealing money from my account and has told lies. End quote. Okay. So he's putting it on him. All right. And and look, it is it is conceivable that you know what's going on and, you know, you just play the role because, you know, you got this guy, you know, you got him on the hook and we're – that the hammer is about to come down, whatever the case may be. But the questions arose because like hours before, and he was just like, Oh, chummy with guy. Like, Hey, yeah. how you doing buddy? Like it's all good or whatever. That was the thing that bothered me about the athletic article is it painted them. Like they were really, really, really close, mm -hmm. like brothers close. Mm -hmm. And so either way, it's a crappy story. Mm -hmm. Right. And if it's, Shohei throwing him under the bus, it sucks. Mm. If that's what he did, it sucks for Shohei. Like either way, it's a it's just a bad story. Yeah. It's a bad story. Hey, you get you gotta I'll take him at his his word, mm -hmm. even though it just I don't know. It, just, it, it doesn't looks funny. Doesn't seem right. Then the the guy, um, the interpreter had a different story. Like they asked him about it. How did it go, Jesse? They asked him about it and he said one thing, and then a day or later that day, he had a completely different statement about what happened. I saw. Oh, I didn't know he no, talked. No, I no. I think that was Otani's camp. I think. Yeah. No, so his I, it, the, oh, the, the, the interpreter. The, the interpreter. I think it went. The interpreter came out and said, "I'm I'm sorry. I apologize." Da 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 da. Or he had a statement or something. And then when he was about to talk again, they nixed that. And then they I've been advised not to talk, right? Because yeah. that's that's what I read. Okay, then they both switched up their stories then because on the ESPN headlines thing right now, I'm looking at it or whatever earlier, and it says that um, originally it was report they're, they're reporting it. Originally, Otani's camp said that um, he was covering debt for his friend or whatever. Now they're saying he was stealing from him. Mm, that's what it was. That's what. So, uh, yeah, and that's the. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So that the first thing that came out was mm. he was covering debt for him. And then it just switched up till he stole it and then another quote from Shohei's press conference said he didn't know about it until a couple days ago i kind of want to know if yeah that doesn't add up though like if one of you two come yeah. to me and say hey i, I could use 4.5 million dollars i've got a debt well i could james i'd be like <laughs> what kind of debt is this like that's the first question well i think i'm a, first of all i don't have 4.5 mil to hand over right but secondly i'm gonna need more about this debt that you're that you've incurred like is it a real estate deal like did you go buy like six popeye chickens <laughs> like what exactly and, happened here i'm confused and these things happen in in entertainment and people dealing with million dollar entertainers but hey we couldn't catch it before it got to 4.5 hmm that's a lot of like, yeah, that's a that's a long ways to go before you actually. Hey, he took four point five million, mm -hmm. not five hundred thousand, mm -hmm. four point five million. We just got it. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. Must be nice to have that type of money where you, you don't notice four point five million. Yeah. But I look, man, he says what he says. He's probably. He, what it is. Yeah. It's probably one of those, yeah, it's, there's, there's probably a lot of people at fault for that. Like when you're an athlete, you, you he probably doesn't manage his bank accounts, mm -hmm. right? And it's not something he's monitoring. There's a, there's a failure on multiple levels here. The problem is if it's interpreter was the one managing the bank accounts, mm -hmm. there's no checks and balances right there. And that's yeah. where you wind up 
potentially in a situation like what he's facing uh, right now. I remember a rod had, he had a, an accountant and like a business manager that lived here in Sacramento area. And they would give him like a weekly stipend Mm -hmm. and that's all he got. Mm -hmm. He couldn't go do anything silly Mm -hmm. because he had so much money coming in and they were making more money off of that money, helping him build, you know, what now he's used to go buy the Minnesota Timberwolves part of that money. Sort of. Sort of. Could help that you helped him get a loan. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Or three loans. Well, it just keeps getting loans. Yeah. But either way, you could kind of see that, you know, some of these guys, they know how to do it and other guys don't. Mm-hmm. You know, Lawrence Funderburg has a book, right? It's like, it's it's all about him being, well, he's very frugal, but also um, about learning to say no to your friends and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's just a horrible problem that, that players have. I've seen some horrible things while I've covered the team mm-hmm. um, that were just like, I can't believe this is happening to somebody. And the, and the, the Kings can't step up and do anything about it. That was always my uh, my problem with them. It, it's like at some point, don't you have to protect your player in some way? Don't you have to help them in some way? And some of these kids, they just don't know how. And you hope that you hope that franchises do, but that's also a that's a task, right? You're you're yep. you have a roster full of guys. Like the stipend thing that you referenced is far more common with athletes, I think, than people realize. Mm-hmm. Um, you see that stuff. It's called hook me up playa. <laughs> see this? Ken? Okay. Lawrence. What's the Lawrence. Amazon? What's the Amazon rating on hook me up playa? Uh, it well, sounds like a book written by Teddy Long. It's 4.5, <laughs> but I will say there's only three reviews. Oh, okay. <laughs> hook me uh, up although playa. the forward is by Lou Pinella. How? I don't. That's random. Yeah. <laughs> that is random. An insider's look into the financial fortunes, oh, misfortunes, <laughs> and fortunate lessons learned from modern day professional athletes. <laughs> yeah. Like it's a problem. I, you know, again, I mean, he's not in the league anymore, but the Ben McLemore situation in Sacramento to me was just like, I, you know, why does Ben McLemore need a publicist on staff? That's that's there all the time. Yeah. Why does Ben McLemore need to pay his aunt and uncle to be his security guards everywhere he goes? You know, like again, like everything was. Bad. Yeah, I would not pay my aunt to guard me. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to tell you that right now. That's oh. not a thing. You um, you don't have to say the player because I don't remember if you have before. There was a situation so bad that the uh, the player would call was it the main was it the king's security guy and he wouldn't like the 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 guy would kind of pick up on the code that he was dropping like do you need me to come over oh no that was that wasn't king security that was that was a player calling his older brother oh okay and the and the and the older older brother brother would come come over and and like everyone leave your keys everybody's keys on the credit cabinet, cards everybody's credit card on the cabinet and he had yeah just like non-stop yeah yeah i mean Awful. ben mclemore would even the, the second time he came around he would have 25 or 50 envelopes of tickets that he's filling out for for player for family members or friends or people who he runs into that he would give tickets to mm-hmm. and so he would be asking all of his teammates first, hey, do you guys have any extra tickets tonight? Do you have any extra tickets? Once he ran out of that, then he would have to give his credit card to the locker room attendant. The locker room attendant would then go buy tickets Mm -hmm. for the game, and then Ben would have to stuff the envelopes, write their names on them, and then send those with the locker room attendant back to go to put them at will call. We're talking... 35 minutes before game. I mean, I'm only allowed in the locker room from 5, 5, uh, 545 to 615. So we're talking up to 45 minutes before the game. He's filling ticket requests. It's crazy. Like, what are, you, what are we doing here? Mm-hmm. Like, why are you not concentrating on the game at hand? Why are you being overwhelmed like this? And it was every single game. It wasn't like a one-off. It wasn't like a bunch of family were in town. He just got abused all the time. And I've... It, it happens. It happens all the time. Yeah. 
Smith does. Uh, you're listening to d and Casey on KIFM West Sacramento, 98.5 FM, KRX, QHD2 Sacramento, ESPN 1320, always live on the free Odyssey app. Uh, our Kings Insider of the Insiders, uh, James Ham, Of course, James and Kyle can be heard Monday through Friday here at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, Hammer, a, a textbook response from the Sacramento Kings on Saturday following a <laughs> brutal loss on brand. to the Washington Wizards. The theme of the season continues. They're able to regroup against a really good Orlando team. And it feels like no matter how much things seemingly change in the end, they're the same. Yeah. I mean, that's, you, we keep waiting for this moment where the light bulb goes off and they stop having these letdown games. It's not going to happen this season. So we just need to understand that and just like play accordingly. Like I, I said on the show earlier, I could see them winning tonight. I could see them winning tomorrow. I could see them winning on Friday and then losing to the Utah Jazz on Sunday. It's just like who this team is right now. And I, I guess the good thing is that they're still, what, 12, 13 games over 500. They're still rolling. They're still, well, what are they, 12 games over? They're still like in the in the chase. They just haven't made life dip easy for themselves. And um, you know, whoever said it, whether it was Mike or whether it was De'Aaron, I can't remember which one. And said, well, you know, we don't, we're not going to play bad teams in the playoffs. So at least we don't have to worry about mm -hmm. that whole issue. Yeah, it's it was like, De'Aaron. Okay. I, I, I get it, but <clears throat> still that doesn't make sense. And watching that game play out against Orlando, just phenomenal. Like they, they were gritty. They had a player come in and do crazy things that were totally outside of who he is as a basketball player and Jonathan Isaac. I mean, the guy's just raining threes and you're looking like, okay, people keep talking like Jonathan Isaac's been really good this year and that's fine. And I know a lot of Kings fans wanted the Kings to go out and, and chase Jonathan Isaac at the trade deadline. And I'm looking and I'm like, man, the dude's averaging six points a game. Like, what are we talking about? The fact that he's got 25, like I, I get it. You don't have anyone that matches up with him. I get it. But at the same time, you know, fall away threes from the corner and stuff. You're like, what is happening? That's not you. Yeah. No, no. Uh, and then, look, I'm glad for Jonathan Isaac to be able to have a moment like that. Yeah, me too. Be able to play because he's been injured and all this other stuff. But there's a reason why everybody was so excited that he was scoring the way he was in the arena on the bench because it don't happen. No. <laughs> so they're like, oh, man, my boy cooking and I see you, dog. Like they don't see this all the time. And and I, and I'm not interested in Jonathan Isaac. I don't have a problem with him or anything like that. I know there's some off the court stuff, but I I ain't really paying attention to that like that. It's just he can't stay healthy. He can't stay healthy. Yeah. So this this idea of bringing him in and you know and and, and having him go pair up with with the rest of these guys, especially after what we saw on on Saturday, I'm not interested. If you if you think that you can get that for. 75 games over the next, you know, or 75 games a year over the next three years. Sure. Send them to a deal or whatever you got to do. I don't, I wouldn't believe that. I haven't seen anything that makes me think that be anything remotely close to happening. So that's, it's okay, guys. Let's leave Jonathan Isaac in Orlando. So, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, he's averaging like he, he's just now up to seven points per game. He's also averaging 15 minutes per game. And I mean, that's what he just tore the Kings apart in the first half in eight minutes. Mm -hmm. So I, I get it. Sometimes there's just a weird, bad matchup or sometimes a guy gets on a heater. But overall, I thought the Kings played well. And I, I thought they were gritty. You know that we talked about it. Like the good thing was that they got four stops in the final 21 seconds. The bad thing was that they needed four stops in the final 21 <laughs> seconds because they couldn't get a rebound. And you're just like, what are you doing? Just put the game away. But like, really, that's a good Orlando Magic team. Yep. That's a good win. And, yep. uh, you know, I, I don't like that it was the, the game that they lost, but a, a two and one road trip. Okay. Uh, you James need... Ham Caraway over here. Look <laughs> at him. Wow. Well, Listen James, to you this, guys. This is what I said, James. If I talked to anybody on last Tuesday, so you got these three games coming up, you're going to beat uh, Toronto and Washington. But you're gonna lose to Orlando for a two and one road trip. Nobody would bat an eye. Yeah, the, I, the teams just got mixed up here this time, and I know it's you know maybe a missed opportunity. If you were two and zero going into the Orlando game, you could get greedy and do. I get all that, but at the end of the day, 
doing one road trip. Yeah, I get that. But I'd also say like this eight game stretch here, we kind of circled and said, look, this is probably the most important eight games that you're going to face all season because you got a bunch of winnable games right up front. And, you know, so it goes Memphis, Toronto, Washington, Orlando, and then you're getting a Philadelphia team that hasn't played that well, a Dallas team that's all over the board, and then Utah. So those eight games, but you need to go seven and one, or you need to go six and two. I don't like going three and one against those first four games, and then looking at the final four and saying, "Okay, I can't. I I only get one. At worst, I can only have one mistake here. Because mm-hmm. if you don't take care of, if you drop two in a row to Dallas, you're in the plan. Mm-hmm. It's over. Like that's it. Yeah. So you need to split with Dallas at least, which means you got to beat Philly." And you've got to beat Utah on Sunday. And I don't know. I, I mean, that's a, a really tough thing. And then you, you're down the sprint with, with the final eight games, which aren't easy at all. But, you know, at least you know you're playing really good teams almost the whole way out. And this team is usually okay there. Which, to a certain degree, is what you got to do anyway. I mean, Philly is a, a tough opponent. They've already beaten the Kings once without Embiid. Tough opponent. But, I, if they would have won the game against Washington, nobody would have been like, well, it's, it's cool to lose this one at home because you're in the same scenario, right? Like you'd have to at least win against Dallas and you'd have to win against Utah. Yeah. It, it's, the game against Orlando saved them to a certain degree. It, it really did oh, save yeah, them yeah. Totally. Uh, winning that game. But you just, you're going to have to win regardless. You're going to have to win to get into the sixth spot. You're going to have to have one of those stretches anyway because Dallas is probably playing better than I, at least I gave them credit uh, to be able to play to end this season. And you don't know what Phoenix is going to do, but Dallas is going to keep that pressure on you where you're going to have to. You got 12 games. You're going to have to go 9-3 and three probably to get in at the sixth spot. Mm-hmm. It's just it – is, it is what it is. It is what, and, and I don't think the Washington game changed that that much anyway. Yeah, I just looked at – you know, of the final 12 games we talk about right here, there are two just games you're going to lose without any question. I mean, you play Boston one night and this team can't beat Boston. I don't, I don't care what anyone says, but they can't beat Boston. And then the other is you have the Pelicans one more time. And again, you haven't beat the Pelicans all year long. It doesn't matter who's playing for them. They've thumped you four times already thumped you. And I don't think that they're, that the Kings really are, are going to just like become someone else and figure out a way to beat that team. Maybe I'm wrong. But uh so now if you're talking nine and three, you got one more. That's it. And you still got a game against the Cavs. You still got Dallas twice. You still have oh, you Phoenix. Got, you uh you I'm saying you, you still got one more to get to nine and three. And so that's where you start getting a little a little in the weeds here with this team. Oh, you meant the the Clippers, maybe because they're done with the Cavs. Maybe with the Clippers. Oh yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. They, they do yeah. play the Clippers. Yep. Yeah. I think the number and I this this will this will turn Kings fans' stomach. The 76ers are 10 and 15 without Joel. Mm. They've been they've been a, a below 500 team without him, but they've been up and down. They have some they've good been, wins though without Joel. Yeah. So they're capable. Yeah. One of them being the one other of them, day. Was one of them against the Kings? That, yeah, cuz Joel, Joel didn't play, play that game no. and, and Tobias scored 90. They beat, uh, he did score 300 points. He, yeah, he did. I'm sorry, it was 300. Yeah. Right. It was 90 <laughs> in the first quarter. They it's beat Dallas like a couple of weeks ago. They beat yeah. the Clippers the other day. Well, salute for the Dallas win. So, you know, they're they're capable. It's it's a tough game. It's a tough game. And, and yeah. you got to be ready to go. You don't have any room for the first game off a road trip and all this other stuff. I did say this, and it, it's once again, hopefully it's the last time I ever say this, not putting lipstick on a pig. Mm-hmm. But um, I talked to James about it on Friday. James, want to know what you think? Do you do you uh, look at the Washington loss and think that was maybe a tougher back to back than we give it credit for? I think they said they got in at like three or four a.m. Mm-hmm. Um, um, on that Thursday, they still should have found a way to beat the Wizards. But when you look at the logistics, ah, you you. Been with professional athletes, they'll they'll tell you. I mean, that back that's a tough back to back. That's a tough little road trip or whatever the case may be. Find a way. Yeah. But 
it's not as easy. I'm not going to diminish any time. Like, I was standing at a concert last night. My back hurt. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to diminish. <laughs> I'm not going to diminish like any athlete who plays a game has to fly and don't do the, oh it's charter it, dude, you're still flying you're sitting you're 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 moving around you're trying to get settled at three o'clock four o'clock in the morning whatever the case is and then you're expected to perform at a high level you want them to do that you want them to be able to operate that way at this time of year um sure it was tough like i, I won't diminish that at all it was tough but you were against the worst team in the league yeah like not figuratively you were very literally against the worst team in the entire league. Mm-hmm. And yeah. everyone else around you has been able to win those games mm-hmm. and you haven't, and it's killing you right now. You or know, you also, you. you have losses to three of the uh, four of the five worst teams in the NBA. Yeah. Charlotte, Washington, Detroit, Portland. You got, you haven't lost to the Spurs, but that's it. The bottom five teams in the league, you've lost a four. Like, there's no explanation for that. Well, I got so frustrated with the Kings earlier, I just said they lost to San Antonio. So it's fine. It's fine. Completely made it up. And, yeah. I mean, the, we keep saying those those games, if you don't make it, you're going to look back on those yep. games. You're going to be like, man, this is this is where we found ourselves in a play in, you know, one game back because we couldn't handle three of those four games or something like that. Then you'd have nobody to look at but yourself if you're the king. So, yeah, I mean, hopefully they don't have to deal with all that. Um, hopefully they just get in, in the, on the sixth spot. And I still think they got as good a chance as anybody else, any of those other two teams, to get there. I still think they're going to get there. They're, they're, I think they'll figure it out. Dallas is playing better than I thought they would, but I still think the Kings will, will get in there and be the sixth seed. Well, I, you also have to look like Phoenix has the worst um, strength to schedule. Well, the most difficult strength to schedule left. Their strength to schedule is a six oh seven. And they're playing nothing but high end playoff teams for the rest of the year. Yeah, they have one game against the Spurs left, and that's their only easiest opponent game. The Kings still have one against the Blazers, one against the Nets, one against the Jazz. But uh, to look at their schedule, and I mean, they still have. Again, a Nuggets game, OKC game, two against the Timberwolves, two against the Clippers, two against the Pelicans, and once against one against the Cavs. That's and that's crazy. So what is that? Four, six, seven, eight, and nine games. Those like that's that's crazy that their last twelve games includes all of those games. And then Dallas, uh, they did have one of the easiest strength of schedules, but all of a sudden they're up to number twenty. They have a four seven six win percentage against yeah, here down the got, stretch. They got Houston twice. Houston came out of nowhere. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, that's true. Yeah, we haven't spent an appropriate enough time talking about how Houston might catch the Golden State. <laughs> eight no. Your thoughts? I mean, eight straight. Let's talk about it. Let's get into it. I think it's interesting <laughs> because people are concerned, like, oh, well, what happens if the Kings are in the play-in? And they might have to face Houston again. And my only response: Yeah, Houston's tough for sure, but they also don't have Alper and Shingun. And that does change everything for a matchup against the Kings. While they've ripped off a whole bunch of wins in a row and a lot of it without him, who is going to handle Sabonis on that team? And I mean, you're going to have to run Boban out there mm-hmm. for stretches against Sabonis. And oh. so I, I don't know. And and then the Kings would just do nothing but drag Boban away from the basket and and try to score on the perimeter. So I don't fear Houston as much as I did before the Shangun injury. Like Houston, I think, is a bad matchup for the Kings, but it's a different beast when Shangun can actually go one on one and hold his own in the post against the bonus. Well, I'm rooting for Houston in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. Good luck to the Rockets. Uh, Rock it up. We, I don't think that that's it. That doesn't sound right. Um, <laughs> We you talked about uh, Singoon being a different you know a difference maker for for Houston. You know, we were talking earlier about Keon being obviously a difference maker for Sacramento. One of the big reasons the Kings were able to win this game on Saturday was not just Keon Ellis and what he's been doing for the team overall, but what he did on the offensive end uh, that day. I think hitting his his first four or five shots, he was connecting from threes, he was scoring at all uh, all three levels. And I the Jesse brought this question up earlier. 
Hammer, how much do you think what we're seeing from Keon Ellis right now changes what the Sacramento Kings approach to the off season might be? Um, well, I think he gives you one of the two answers. Like, I, I think you had uh, one of the two questions, like answers to the questions. Mm-hmm. I think this team clearly has to improve defensively at the two and they have to improve at the three slash four one of the two and that's because keegan can play either one and so now i think you go into the off season knowing that you might you're going to get an, a large enough sample size from keon ellis to know whether you can trust him to potentially be a starter next year mm-hmm. and it's going to take a little while because you know i think one thing that people need to understand is that you know the gravitational pull that is kevin herter on the offensive end keon is hitting shots and that's great, but he doesn't have the same cachet that Herder does right now. Mm. Maybe 12 games from now, if he's still shooting 40, 40 plus percent from three, you're going to see teams start to, you know, move towards him a little bit and at least game plan a little bit for him. But he's got to continue to shoot at the same clip that he is right now to keep defenses honest. And we're going to have some off games. Like we've already seen it. He was one of, you know, a couple of players that had bad nights the other night against against Washington. You're going to see off nights from him because he's a young player, and that's what happens. Mm-hmm. But I, I think the consistency that you're hoping for, it should be there. Because um, some of the things that I've been looking at, I looked at advanced numbers on him today. As a catch-and-shoot three-point shooter, he's shooting 41.3% from the field. Uh, on pull-ups, he's at 35.3. 51% of his shots his catch and his three pointer attempts are, are catch and shoot. Here's something crazy. 74.8% of his field goal attempts are threes. And that's wild. And he's shooting 30, 39%. And on the defensive end, he's just flat out incredible. Like what he's been able to do so far. And like, you hope that it holds up, but overall he's holding his opponent to negative 4.8% from the field on three pointers, negative 9.8%. He's holding his, his opponent under like what the Kings are typically holding their teams to. So greater than 15 feet, 11.6%. He's under their, their regular shot, their regular field goal percentage. He's just extremely good defensive defensively. And he's not letting players get by him and he's not getting abused in any way, shape or form. He's had, what the one bad game against Jalen Brunson. And outside of that, I, I don't even know what his stats would look like if it wasn't for that one game where he got lit up and Brunson's tough. Yeah, he is. Would, would you say that he is part? So we've been having this discussion, you know, last couple of days, the closing lineup, everybody's talking about the starting lineup and all this other stuff. The closing lineup is Keon in the same places Malik Fox Sabonis or is he more Harrison Keegan uh and himself I guess Keon yeah fluctuating I'm, versus solidified yeah I'm gonna say that he's really close to solidifying because the last five minutes of a game it slows down but you still need a defensive minded player especially against ISO ISO ball which is typically what happens in the NBA in the last five minutes you get a lot of isolation with great players and i want keon in that situation more often than not i mean we saw it the other night he played 37 minutes you know and he's got to clean up the free throw shooting i think he's like a 65 percent free throw shooter and that's going to be something that you're you're going to shy away from a little bit Mm -hmm. but if if i can sort of ride the hot hand between keegan and harrison whoever has it going that night and then rely on keon with monk and fox the fact that he's six four, six five gives you a little bit of range. He can play the the two three, you know, against bigger players. Of course, he's going to struggle a little bit, but just like the way he's been able to play up in size is pretty crazy. And you know, no one can get a shot off against him from the perimeter. You know, we talked about this. Uh, I had all this written down for the insiders today, but uh, you know, on the season, the Kings their offensive rating, you know, sixteen point one sixteen point six. Pre All Star break, it's one sixteen point six. Post All Star break, it's one sixteen point four. They're basically the same offensive team, but 
what we've seen is the league as a whole, the defensive numbers have gone like way down since the all-star break, right? Everyone, because they're not calling fouls. The fact that the Kings are still at almost the same identical offensive rating pre and post all-star break shows you that their offense is actually working better than it was before because they're actually holding to the same line where everyone else is diving. And then the defensive metrics are crazy. The Kings are all the way up to number 15th in the league with a defensive rating of 115.1. Since the All-Star break, the Kings are at 111.6. And that's just, their net rating since the All-Star break is a, is a plus 4.8. And Mike Brown talked about this at the All-Star break. Um, you know, coming out, he's like, look, if we can just be a league average defender from three, Right, just league average, mm -hmm. like hold te teams to whatever. He said we would be a number eight. We'd be number eight in, in defensive rating. Mm -hmm. And right now in the the games since the All Star break, which is like what fifteen games, they're at thirty six point three over sixteen games. They're they're holding their opponents from three to thirty six point three percent. And it was at thirty nine point seven before. So forty percent. They've shaved almost four percent off their their three-point shooting defense, which is incredible. And part of shaving that number down is that other teams aren't even taking as many. They're taking two less threes per game because the Kings are playing them better defensively. And so those are good signs. That's how, if if that 36.3% that they're holding their opponents to since a break, that would be 13th best in the league overall. And all of a sudden, their defense is skyrocketing because of it. So... Like, look, Mike Brown kept talking about we have to be better defensively and we've got to do it now because we can't just crank it up in the playoffs. I think we've seen it. We've seen the response from the team and it hasn't been perfect, but name a team in the league that's really been perfect. Like the All-Star break. Well, Houston's one of the better teams in the league. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, like everybody's inconsistent except for Denver, who's just like, okay, it's time for us to dominate everybody. Well, Boston's pretty good. Yeah, Boston. <laughs> Like this, this, this ignoring of what the Boston oh, Celtics no, no, are doing is is absurd. Well, I I say that because I saw something. I can't. I don't remember. Athletic ESPN. Hell, it might have been the NBA that had power rankings, and Denver was number one. Like I'm matter. sorry, Boston is like seven games better than than Denver. What are we doing? I don't understand this notion that Denver's unbeatable. I just I don't get it. They're they're a championship contender. They're the reigning champs. They're really really good. But this thought that nobody can beat Denver is kind of crazy. Absurd. I think I, there's teams in the in the West that I think could beat Denver. Boston right now has a, the number two offense in the league and the number one uh, defense in the league. They're plus twelve net rating. And Jesse said, like that's like the fourth best point differential of all time yeah. yeah they have the fourth best point differential of all time Jeez. yeah it's absolutely crazy the right ahead of the 2015 or 17 warriors one of those two it might be 17 warriors yeah i i did their number one offense and number two defense it, it's wild what they're doing right now they're just they're so good and i think everyone's overlooking them because they haven't been able to get it done they just you know in the past they they're they're not a team who's won the won a chip in a while and until you do that People are always going to have a little hesitation with you, just like they did with Denver until Denver won one last year. Yeah, people are crazy. Pretty much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Didn't really feel like there was much hesitation with Denver either, but I guess to a certain degree there was. Uh, back to the Kings, though. You were talking about their improvements on the defensive end, how collectively as a team they've been better defensively. And not to not to keep beating the same drum, but how much of that is a credit to Keon Ellis? And I speculated earlier that you know, we've heard different players. Harrison is the one who stands out the most where he talks about how Keon, you know, lifts certain guys up. And and, and De'Aaron has talked about how, he, you know, he can play a little bit differently on the defensive end with Keon out there. How much of that is the other four players on the floor don't have to make up for one guy's mistakes? And how much of that is 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 Keon just being a really good defender and allowing those guys to focus solely on on their task at hand on the defensive end? Well, I might have just asked the same thing. No, I'm, I'm not sure I don't think I did you did. Just... Okay, so like, look, there's no question. I'm like there. There's no comparison between Keon Ellis and Kevin Herter as a defensive player. There's just not. So, I mean, number one, you're getting much much better at that position. 
defensively. And that's just not who Kevin Herter is. So I think that that's one point that I would make. But I'd also point to the fact that when you have multiple weak links on the defensive side and then you swap out one of those with a better defender, it does make it so you're not scrambling as much. And and the fact that De'Aaron Fox doesn't have to defend the toughest guy for an entire game like he has the entire season mm. uh, on the perimeter, that's a big deal because now Fox should have more bounce. He should have more left in the tank to, number one, defend better, but also to carry you offensively. Mm. So I, I think the, the long-term impact of having Keon Ellis in the starting lineup is is huge. Like we we're only seeing the first like what does it look like type deal, but over a an eighty two game schedule, I mean I I would think that there's potential for him to continue to get better as a player, mm -hmm. and I also think that you could have a situation where Keon becomes like a Tony Allen, like like I always bring up Eric Snow. I think one of the problems that you have with the Kings is you've never had someone to put next to De'Aaron who is like an Eric Snow next to Allen Iverson, where all he has to do is is defend, hit an occasional shot, and and again, Keon Ellis is a much better shooter than Eric Snow ever was. But defensively, he just took the pressure off all the time off of AI and allow him to do what he does and just float around the perimeter and be open all the time and I think that that's it's sort of the pairing you've been waiting for for the Kings to find. Find me somebody that can play along this, uh, alongside De'Aaron that is a 3 and D specialist mm -hmm. and doesn't make a bunch of mistakes, but allows De'Aaron to be who he is and take some of the pressure off De'Aaron on the defensive side. As the czar of the early 2000 Philadelphia 76ers, mm -hmm. I would say I'd want Keon to be Aaron McKee yeah. as opposed to Eric Snow. Yeah, even I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. I like George that. Lynch. I, like I mean, the Kings still need George Lynch yeah, yeah, yeah. in like this in this idea. You know, they do, and they need Theo Ratliff as well. Man. Well, you know, you could be Raja Bell. Raja yeah. Bell was on that team. But Jermaine see, Jones was on that team. Raja Bell is also a really good comp for what Keon is doing right now. Mm -hmm. If you can get him to become like a Raja Bell type, and the Raja other Bell thing would be perfect, that we're talking about here, he's so inexpensive for the next three years, like two years after this. And then he's a restricted free agent. He can't go anywhere. Like this is, this oh, is exactly God. how you build a team. Mm. You, you find diamonds in the rough, you develop them. And the Kings have, you know, shout out to Dutch Gately and, and the development staff in Sacramento and to Bobby Jackson and his crew last year at Stockton. They've done a great job of bringing this kid along. And, and Keon has done a great job of responding and learning and, being a sponge and learning how to handle the ball better and not being a, like he's a functional offensive player. Mm -hmm. And that's great. Got to respect Bobby Jackson and the teams that he coaches. Absolutely. Be it as a head coach or an assistant coach, you got to respect those teams. Absolutely. They play hard. They do. Shout we'll out to Rodney tonight. Buford too. He was on that uh, Sixers team. Uh, Matt Geiger. Oh yeah. Matt uh, Geiger. On there. The Geiger D.L. Ratliff was there. Got traded during the deadline with Simbo, uh became a Sixer. Yeah. We also, uh, we'll get to see Bobby Jackson tonight. Yeah, that's what I was alluding to. And, and Brian Gates. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, what, that's definitely yeah. what I was alluding to. Big Brian Gates fan as well. Uh, we'll come back. We'll talk more with James Ham. The Sacramento Kings take on the Philadelphia 76ers tonight. First of four home games mm -hmm. this week. -ish, well, well yeah, the, it's five-game homestand for this week. What's Clippers, the fifth game? The Clippers is the like Clippers Tuesday or something. Like that. There it is, the Clippers. We'll come back. We'll talk more with James Ham here on Sacramento Sports Leader, ESPN 1320. Yo, Drew down. Come on, man. It can't be. <laughs> well, Drew. <laughs> How much time do we have? I like three minutes or so. All right. I'll be right back. This came hours after I'm saying. To Kenny, when four o'clock gets here, we need to be able to focus on the KSFM show. But it's become such a hey, get this recorded, get the and it's on both sides. It's, it's like, are we? I'm fine. I'm fine with it. I get it. But like, man, are we just 
I'm just, I'm just not willing to commit to putting on a shit product on the other station because we're being pulled in so many different directions. But we got it. I know you're watching, Charlie. I got you. 15 seconds. It's valuable stuff. It'll work. Poor Devin. My man didn't get the memo. We got kicked out of that TNT slot, sir. Well, we got kicked out, but we got a new one added. Yeah, we're back, though. We're back. So Thursday, not this Thursday, that the Thursday of that week, in the garden, Kings will be on TNT. And that might even be better because we won't have to be with uh, Candace and him. No. Well, Soren, there's no need to feel that way about Kenneth Parker. I wouldn't go that far. I do watch, um, I watch those uh, NCAA games. <laughs> and I'm not sure Kenny watches any of those games. <laughs> Kenny just be like, well, like when you have Kentucky, you're going to have a good team. So if you have Oakland, that team typically isn't going to be as talented as Kentucky. So, And I love California. So, I mean, you know, them boys from California <laughs> is different. Kenny, it just looks like he doesn't watch any of this stuff. Well, I think that's true for NBA basketball, too. If this, obviously it's very early, but if, if this score holds, no matter what else happens, just give me one more. Mm. Just give me one more. One more Ooh, win. Nelly. One That's more be, win. Get your popcorn ready. One more win. There's I don't history think history behind that one. I don't think she's ever done it. I think she's played him once as the head coach of Duke. I think just once. And then she was, you know, Tarasi era. And their best chance was the year Tamika got hurt. And she still almost beat them. You guys seen this John Tace Porter, uh, Porter story? Yeah, I just, I, I, I saw that. Prop betting irregularity uh, irregularities. I didn't think bet I, on whether he'll play or not. <laughs> I don't know that why like what's an irregularity that you prop bet because you're not allowed to have a prop bet if you're a player. I don't know. It's a good question from Sal. I mean, who are we rooting for should this happen? Wow. We root for wow. Duke. We root for Duke. Wow. Wow, Jesse, Sal. Jesse. Throw up the Didn't house divided wow. sign. Oh, for Sal. Oh, no. Wow. Oh, for Duke. Look at that. Damn, be careful. He's going to hit you with a logo like Ric Flair. Unbelievable. Ric Flair Caraway over here, the dirtiest player in the game. Unbelievable. Wow. Hey, man. Like I, said, hey, I can be bought. Book ones, and I'm all in. <laughs> man, what did Dawn ever get you? Got my Gucci sweater. <laughs> Mm, that's a good call. Oh, man. That would be a national championship game. I would, I would root for Duke in that. 
Oh man, what a natty. Come on now. Absolutely. All right. Hey, Paige with the floater. Oh, with the dime. Well, Brian, the phrases handle hard better. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, that's a blue chew ad. My goodness, man. Brian. Take a lap, Brian. Brian. <laughs> yeah, take a Brian. lap. <laughs> Some push ups or something, man. Boy, <laughs> the chatty house. Boy. I love it. Yeah, I love the chatty yeah. house. Boy, I love him. I love him. <laughs> Brian's taking a laugh. He got the see, got the saying all wrong. Hey, but Brian is hyped up tonight, though, because another opportunity to boo the crap out of Buddy Hill. Well, yeah, he's excited about that. <laughs> Brian is hyped up, understandably so. Good understandably so. You think that'll ever stop, uh, James? The booing of Buddy. I think it should right now, but I don't, you know, it, it's not going to. But he doesn't get booed because of how he finished his career in Sacramento. He gets booed because he, he talked trash afterwards. Mm. So no, I don't think it will. Like Kings fans still hate Jason Terry. And Jason Terry is, well, I mean, I think he's an assistant somewhere, but yeah, they don't like Jason him. Terry. They, you know, they don't like Spencer Hawes. Spencer Hawes, well, that'll never change. They don't like anyone who, after they left here or or just talk trash about the city. And that's that's the problem that Buddy has. That, you know, he he said Sacramento could, I can't remember. Oh, exactly. I remember what he said. <laughs> but and it that, wasn't pleasant. And to be, and, and for full context for that, Buddy didn't talk about the city. He talked about the organization. He didn't have anything bad to say, like, Sacramento, the city sucks. He thinks the organization. I mean, he's the guy who played college basketball in Oklahoma. Norman, Oklahoma. So, I mean, I'm not sure that, like, have you been to Norman, Oklahoma? No, don't plan on it. No. Yeah, me either. Me neither. Yeah. Well, now James is going to war with the Sooners. Like, <laughs> God, hey, bless yeah. it. Like, when I was growing up, I was a Sooners fan because my grandma <laughs> lived in Oklahoma. And she uh, she married a guy who was friends with Buddy Switzer, uh, with Barry Switzer, and so they uh, like she hung out with like the guys from OU. But yeah, I was I was an OU fan when I was young. But yeah. Anyway, yeah, I right. still I still don't want to go to Norman, no, Oklahoma. No, no. I don't want to go anywhere in Oklahoma. It's not well, very maybe nice. Maybe one of these days, if I get you know all expenses paid for or something like that. Yeah, sure, sure. All expenses, boy. All expenses paid for a trip to Norman, Oklahoma. As long as you're going to a football game, yeah, I that's what I'm saying. Be so Maybe bad. Go see a yeah. game. Go see a football game. Yeah, it wouldn't be so bad to go into a football I mean, game. See Lo and KC live from Norman, Oklahoma. No, I don't see the reason for that to happen. When Oklahoma huh? plays Colorado or something. What do you do in Norman besides go to an Oklahoma game? Nothing. See if you can find good old Jr. Maybe. Yeah. What did Jr. have? Hot sauce or barbecue, barbecue sauce? sauce. Barbecue. Well, he has a whole line of condiments. He's Spicy mustard and beef jerky. He's got all sorts of stuff. I know when I went as a kid, like the big thing to do in Oklahoma was to go to the snow cone store. They had like big, it like instead of ice cream shops, they had like snow cone places. Yeah. O Oklahoma never been so down bad ever before. Like that place stinks. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, James no. just buried it too. No. Oklahoma, you stink. My uh, my well, mom was born in Shawnee, Oklahoma. So like, I do have some, like, I've been there multiple times, and you know, it's the home of of Mickey Mantle. And I've never been anywhere in the middle of the country except for in Texas. That's the middle of the country, but I just fly over the middle of the country. Mm, okay. One of these days, though, I'll stop somewhere. Okay. <sighs> well, anyway, Buddy and the Sixers are here today. Buddy and the Sixers. <laughs> Uh, Joel is not, and the Philadelphia 76ers are 10 and 15 uh, when Joel and B doesn't play. Of course, that comforts absolutely nobody no. uh, because one of those 10 wins was, in fact, against uh, the Sacramento Kings. As a matter of fact, has Joel played the Kings 
at all the last two seasons? Uh, the last year he played. He played one then. Yeah. He didn't That's play both. That's the uh, uh, not Metu, but uh, what's my oh, man's name? Uh, Namias Kata. Namias just. Yeah. <laughs> They put oh, they put Namias yeah. Kata in the game. Oh, that was bad. Oh, that was so uncalled for. Before the for. game, it was like, yeah, Namias is going to be the backup center for a couple of games. That lasted three minutes. <laughs> that was so bad. Three minutes and like three fouls. Yeah. It was not good. Nasty. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Like, I was watching the, the Magic game, and they talked about De'Aaron hitting the shot. I, maybe it's just me. that I had to take a – was that last year or was that – Two years ago. Like, I couldn't remember. It seemed like it was so long ago. It was only a year ago. Yeah, that was last year. Yeah, it was only a year ago. You know, the last time the Kings beat the uh, Philadelphia 76ers, it was. Oh, let me think. Let me think. Let me think. It wasn't when Tyrese was here. Oh, I remember. I At least I think I do. It wasn't when they played no. Scranton. Dave Yeager was the coach. I think it was 2018. It's 10 games. They've lost 10 straight. I remember the game at the Golden One Center because I remember oh, who was. Oh, the Aaron had a game winner. No, who? that was the year before. No. Oh. That was 2017 no, the as a rookie. Kings dominated this game. Who um, who was the coach Bruh, on Brown? that staff that he, he came Brown? from the Phoenix Mercury? No, uh, the, the Kings staff. He was on Jaeger's staff. He came from the Phoenix Mercury. The Mercury or the Suns? The Mercury. Um. God, I can't remember his name, but I remember not Igor Kokoskov. Or no, it was definitely has. not. Yeah. I definitely have not had a conversation with Igor Kokoskov. <laughs> but I was sitting with him courtside, oh, and he gave me the whole no before the game. The same place you go. Will you stop? Jason, uh, will you stop? The he he told me he was like, "This is what we're going to try to do. We're going to push the tempo. We're going to try to wear Joel Embiid out." We're going to throw a bunch. Of, and that like I he he told me all of that before the game. And I watched them execute that damn near to perfection. And they wound up winning that game. That's what I'm assuming is their last win against them. I feel I like don't it might have been De'Aaron because the next Walton, year. I don't feel like Luke Walton. Why? 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 Well, just was that called for? Probably not. It probably wasn't. It's for I'm Luke. sorry. Just Luke. minding his business in Cleveland, trying to get ready for the playoffs. I do know that. When they fired Luke, I think the next game was against Philly. Philly had five starters out, and yeah, the Kings went Scranton. I remember that. Would you call him Scranton eighty seven or something? Something like that. Yeah, it was. It was not good. It was not good. I'm trying to think who you're talking about with the with the Kings. Um. So so who were uh, Brian like, Gates? Who 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 am I missing? Like I Jason I, March. I think that's who it was. Yeah, he came from the Phoenix Mercury. I don't know that he came from the Phoenix Mercury, but I know he he was like maybe a a, a video coordinator uh, for the Phoenix Mercury. Because we used to talk yeah, about Jason the WNBA March. a lot. We yeah. used to talk talk about the WNBA all the time. Okay, so his staff was Brian Gates, Jason March, Bob, Big Bob Thornton. Yeah, I love Bob. Dwayne Tickner. Tick is yep, amazing. Elson fantastic. Turner. Uh, and then they had Dan Hartfield, yeah, who was Jason. an advanced cut. It, it was Jason. Yeah. To, I think this is the last time they won. They beat the year they they beat the Sixers um, on De'Aaron's game winner. They actually beat them twice that year. Hmm. They beat them 109, 108. This is the 17 18 season. 109, 108 at home. That was De'Aaron's shot. And then the other one was 101, 95 in. Philadelphia. One oh the the Aaron shot was that the shot at the rim? No, no he, he like shot a sixteen footer over Embiid, and that's the night where I cannot remember that. That's the game where Willie Cauley Stein had two unbelievable stops in the final like twenty seconds against Embiid. A great got, closeout too by De'Aaron at the end of that game. He got one that set up the Fox play, and then he got one after the Fox uh, bucket, and stopped Embiid and then we got him we got Willie Cauley Stein he tried to get out of the locker room early and we caught him in the hallway to the locker room what is he she was trying to make a run for it he was he was he was trying to make a run for it and then outside the locker room that's when he started I asked him about like his two defensive stops and that's when he started talking about how he's a unicorn and he's like Porzingis oh I remember that that it was that night oh that was that 
Yeah. Wild. <laughs> I had I a couple of that. I had a couple of doozies with him. Because... I can't remember De'Aaron's shot. That's killing me. It wasn't at the buzzer. No, was... there was like seven seconds left. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. I think it was right. I before... cannot remember that. So there, the, the streets are saying there. the game that you're thinking of, February second, twenty nineteen. Mm-hmm. Kings beat the Sixers 115-108. Okay. The, but point being, that was the last time they beat them. That's mm-hmm. that, that was the whole gist of what we were getting to. That was the last time they beat them, right? Yeah. 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 So uh Fox hit a uh an 18 foot jumper with 14 seconds remaining, and then Bede missed a an 18 foot jumper at the buzzer. And that's how the Kings got the got the win. And at the 113 mark, Embiid missed a two a two point layup from three feet and was blocked by Willie Cauley Stein. Mm-hmm. And then Cauley Stein was part of the final possession. And at the 25 second mark, uh, Embiid missed a two foot hook uh, a three foot hook shot that was also blocked by Willie Cauley Stein. So Willie had two blocks in the final minute 13. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm laughing because I'm at the. And that was a, it was a great, uh, great moment. Uh, De'Aaron, I remember De'Aaron's crazy closeout at the end of that game, preceding uh, Willie Cauley Sign's block on that final play. But I'm looking at the last time they won. Oh yeah, here it is. I gotta watch this. And the the King, the Sixers only had three people in double figures. It was Jimmy Butler, Joel Embiid, and Ben Simmons. 29 apiece for Embiid and Butler, 22 for Bill Sim- Bill Simmons, Ben Simmons, and everybody else was in single digits. The Kings were led by 34 from Shivano. Mm. 34 on the night for Shivano, seven threes. Fox had 19. <laughs> Willie Cauley Stein had 19. Marvin Bagley with 14. I'm sorry to be that guy. I'm watching the shot right now. De'Aaron looks like a child. Oh, yeah. The little spiky De'Aaron hair. De'Aaron looks like an absolute child. In yes. I think video. he actually had him in braids that year. Right? No, he, he's he got like the twist. He's got the. Because it was hanging. The, the Dragon Ball Z. Down as opposed to being spiked out a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it looks like he got the twist in. Yeah. Oh, man. Young Fox. <laughs> Young Fox right there, So baby. what was that? That was. Seven, six, seven years ago? A minute ago. Wow. Yeah, well, that, that game that we were talking about was the November 2017 game. But that's not the last time the Kings beat them. Yeah, we just said that was February 2nd. 2019. 2019. Yeah, yeah. So it's been 10 games. That's, that's uh, a, it's a solid chunk of time. Uh, it's not, it's not well, that hey, far it, away from Milwaukee. <laughs> I was going to say, it's not as bad as Milwaukee, but, mm. you know, we... we it's been, like put two an, years on Milwaukee. Put an end to that streak, so let's... uh. See if they can continue that. Yeah, it was a rough one. Oh, you guys might have lost me. Best of De'Aaron Fox's career clutch baskets. Ooh. Oh? Yeah, I'm no go the Miami right. Heat. See, this is like a so they just showed the Orlando shot. Like, that's adult De'Aaron. After <laughs> it's oh, they wild didn't do it in chronological it. order. Well, apparently yeah. they're not. This might just be last year's. This just might be all of the it. clutch shots he hit last year. We got uh, he just hit, hit the he hit the I'm F and nice Ooh, on, Chicago. on Chicago. Yeah. We got Miami, a couple. Oh, here's times. the Miami one. Yeah, put back with Miami. The put back Woo! with Miami. He had one at home against yeah. Miami. He had one against Brooklyn at home. Then he had one against the Bro, Knicks. This is wild. The the put back against Miami. I'm sorry, I'm gone. I'm just watching Fox <laughs> highlights the rest of the show. Final score of that game. Anyone remember? No. 89, 88. <laughs> oh no. 89, 88 on the Fox put back. Again, that that's oh oh my god. Uh, uh, bubble, bubble clutch basket. Oh, what game was that? He beat the Wizards with 0. 0.7 seconds oh, yeah, left. Yeah, yeah, in Washington, I remember that. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. It's not bubble. It's but it was no one I allowed. Mean, yeah, it's, uh, well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Washington. It's empty arena. Hmm. How long is the video? It is two minutes. Oh, <laughs> I thought he was gonna say like ten, no, eleven minutes. But it's literally just showing the basket, like it's 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 just showing the. They the, need to tell me the whole story. Well, well, yeah, you don't get the whole story with this one. You get the little runner against Brooklyn that tied it at a hundred. Mm-hmm. Oh, look at Shivano right there to greet him. <laughs> Good teammate, Shivano. Good teammate. Good teammate, man. He'll be yeah. cheered loudly tonight. <laughs> mm-hmm. There he is, beating Utah. 
this boy beat is U- when he beat too. utah uh i don't know what year this is this is that a home no it was in utah what yeah boy mm. fox he got oh man here that that under discussed uh miss free throw oh yeah against oh, minnesota. minnesota yeah yeah, yeah. That was clutch that was clutch. That was uh, executed to, be illegal. to perfection. Well, NBA said it was illegal. Well, that's fine. That's their yeah. problem. That's their. Why, why don't you guys review the Lakers foul discrepancy? <laughs> oh my gosh! Review the Lakers foul discrepancy and then come talk to me, James. That's ridiculous. Did you did you see that story about the Lakers having like this year alone having like three hundred more fouls called than Anyone? the second place team? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's ridiculous. Well, that they have the ultimate foul grifter, Austin Reeves. Well, so well, there's that, <laughs> there, there's that. But then Jesse was talking about they're like 27th in attacking the basket. So it's not even like this team that just puts their head down and always attacks the basket. They're just they're just getting preferential treatment. Three hundred more foul calls than anybody else in the Bobo league. Bobo was right. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. <laughs> Bobo was right. You know, I I think I think it was top. Tom Haberstroh tweeted, like, no one ever said that you have, that the officials have to call the same amount of fouls on each team. And that's a good point. Like, we we always talk about how, like, oh, they got so many more fouls than the Kings. It's like, yeah, there are plenty of games where it makes sense where you're like, okay, that was a foul, that was a foul, that was a foul, and you missed all of them. Mm -hmm. But then there are other games where you're just like, okay, man, you shot 47 three-point shots. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about how many fouls you didn't get. Like you didn't get any fouls because you didn't play physical. So some teams play that style of ball and you know, LeBron is going to get foul calls, but it's not just because he's LeBron. It's because he's six, eight, 280 well, pounds and bull rushes the rim and yeah, people but he, foul, him. but he doesn't like, apparently they don't play that brand of ball. They're 27th, like 20, that 27th most attacks to the basket in the league. Mm. And you've got 300 more? No, I, I look, that's crazy. And LeBron James just happens to be on your team. <laughs> and that's why I keep saying that is you crazy. do not want to play a, a play-in game against no, that's, that's fact. LeBron James. It's going to be yeah. tough for the Rockets. Yeah. You you want to play a play-in game against <laughs> LeBron, it's you will get nothing. You have got to beat them by 10 or 15 points. There There is no like, – when he wants to put his foot on the gas – He's either going to dunk on you or he's going to get a foul call every single time down the stretch. Jalen Green got to be mentally prepared for that. Yeah, they're not going to favor Dylan Brooks. I know what you're doing. <laughs> Stop it. Jay Sean Tate. Jay Sean Tate's going to foul the living. <laughs> yeah. Nothing's done yet. I think the Warriors will get in, though. I, I, I think, though. I don't know. We, Dylan right. Brooks in that game. Dylan Brooks, LeBron James. Ooh. Oh. oh. <laughs> Fix it, Adam. Fix it. Could you imagine if the Rockets beat the Lakers in the play? Oh, nah, that's a good call, James. God. I didn't even think about that. We Fix it. Hear the that. Warriors got they got four championships. They don't need to be in no playoffs. No more. Man, forget that. I want to see Dylan versus LeBron with a trip to the next playing game. On the <laughs> <laughs> a trip to the next playing game is amazing. <laughs> Well, hopefully it's not against Sacramento. Hopefully Sacramento oh, is please no uh, in the sixth spot, but. <sighs> There's we haven't talked. I mean, obviously, it doesn't pertain to us. The 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 Pelicans, you know, within half the, the the Clippers. I guess they're off. Clippers just they they're on All Star break. I yeah, feel they're like on the Clippers that Phoenix have, schedule. Yeah, good for them. Mm-hmm. Good for them. Phoenix is on the Phoenix schedule again. Man, they got that AARP schedule. Man, it's like <laughs> it's like Adam knew. Like man, let's give these guys some. Let's give these old mm-hmm. guys some late rest. But the Pelicans are within half a game of 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 the Clippers there for uh, four. Um, Phoenix, we mentioned, has San Antonio uh, before their schedule gets uh, a little bit tougher. And Hammer, it, it feels like, and, and this is where, you know, the context of your, well, we're going to run out of time here, but the context of what KC was talking about earlier, where, you know, if you had gone, if you knew you had gone two and one, you just reversed the games. The truth is, the way it would have played out, the Kings would have gone, you know, two and oh, or, 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 or whatever the record was at the time of the Washington game. Looking at the rest of the outcomes, it would have been like, well, now they need to beat Orlando because no one's losing. Mm-hmm. And that's the the frustrating part about this is these guys are are playing, you know, Portland and beating them, mm-hmm. San Antonio and beating them. That's why the loss to Washington is so frustrating. 
Oh no, totally. One of the reasons. Why. Well, yeah, yeah, well, right. Yeah, fat. Right. It's because right. of all the others. Yeah. I mean, it yep. makes it worse, but also you are where you are in the standings, and it's a really, really tough spot to be. I do, I do want to give a shout out to Mike Brown though, who, you know, guaranteed a a five hundred season for the Kings yesterday, and that's the tenth time since the team moved in in thirty nine seasons since Amazing. they moved to Sacramento, uh, and eight of them were Rick Adelman, two of them were Mike Brown. That's uh, incredible. The 